the basics of Python. So why did you choose Python? You're also <laughs> Easy. It's a nice snake. Nice name. Not yet. Why oh, Python? No, I didn't see it. It's the most widely used in Python. Yeah, at least one of them. Look. Yeah. You can run a lot of data. Mm, yes, that's probably true, but that's probably true for most languages. That mo more depends on what compute you have. Why reach my is powerful enough for Google? Because Google uses it. It's not bioinformatics. Uh, efficient? Fast, I say? Broad? So it was, uh, if I, I don't remember my slides, but I guess it was actually more than 20 years old probably to start with, but it's, I think it's more the last 10 years it started being used more easy. Python is not Python. <coughs> okay. So there are actually, okay, so that's, yeah, that's, my, and somehow that's all languages, it's like it's not just one program, it's like maybe if you are C++ and uh, Microsoft have their own version of and but are standards, like basically, so the, there is a, yeah, C Python, which is, so I think the arena Python is actually written in Python. So the program that runs, that makes the program run is in Python. But there is one in C Python instead, that basically should do the same thing, but might be uh, if more efficient, is one in Java, so this is Java, J Python, is that what it is? I don't know why that is important, but because I never used anything else, but that's at least this person thinks so. Easy. Mm. This is actually, well, it's somehow this is kind of what I think most, for most people, what strengths out is the, the syntax. So basically what you have, if you want to make a loop or if statement, you have to have put things on the next line with a fixed number of spaces or a tab into it, which is, I don't know any other language that has the same syntax. Most other languages do the same thing, but you have a parenthesis or a curl curly parenthesis or something like that instead of doing that. Or even uh, you have just a statement which is begin and end. But so that, that is maybe some, so it doesn't really matter what on the line you write things. You can write it with all you want, you can write everything on one line basically. But it, it, it somehow ma forces you to make the program to look decent. It's easy to read. You see it, everything here in the same spot. It's easy to get there. So you see that these are, are it's a block of things done together. There are, probably, there are some of the disadvantages of this also. Like if, you, if you make a mistake, if you add one space too much, too little, you get the wrong answer. So that's, um, you have to be a bit careful. And of course, if you're a big program, it's easy to get things a bit mixed up. So, um, okay. Any more questions? So, no, I don't know. Did you? Who, who knew? Who have used Python before? One, one and a half, two. <laughs> so who? Is you know more about some other programming language than Python? Well, you? A little bit about Ruby. Ruby? And you? I used to know Bash and MATLAB. Uh, yeah. MATLAB is like the engineering thing. But you see. MATLAB also? Yeah, it's in Pascal. Is MATLAB built on Python? What? Is MATLAB? No. I, no, I don't think so. I mean, MATLAB is. Uh, it's 
not no, I don't think it's the end of the relationship at all. MATLAB is, uh, I mean, it's very much of course from doing mathematical, cal- or not mathematical, but like doing calculation being numbers. So actually, it's quite a lot of things that are very efficient in MATLAB. So there are optimizers that are, if you have linear, I mean, not particular mathematical problems that are only or almost only exist in MATLAB. One problem I have with MATLAB is that it's actually uh, part, part I don't know it. That's, that's one problem. But that's uh, but that's uh, it's also uh, it's licensing, which is makes it um, as, as I, it's often free for students. You often get them free, like and the drug dealer gives out the first shots for free. Um, but uh, and it's very good for many things. But it's uh, if you want to make something commercial, or even something even if you want to make a web server using the MATLAB code in the back end, it's probably not really allowed in license, you need to specific, buy a specific license for it. And even when we have it running on, I have it on the cluster, but not on all the clusters, and it's the on this universal license. So it's always like a bit of a problem. It's often a bit of a problem, work around it and things like that. And it's not, so it's it's more in the engineering and physics part of the side that people use it. So there, are, there, are, there are some codes for use it. Um, there are programs that we use. So the, and for some things, of course, your code gets very nice and compact and handling big matrices and things like that and making nice plots and things like that. So it's uh, the other language that is actually is coming, becoming quite common is uh, it's R. So it's a statistical project. So it's somehow, it's not really MATLAB, but it's more for statistics. Like, uh, But it's many things you can do in MATLAB. Most people use MATLAB for making nice plots and nice handling big data and making, maybe some simulations and things like that. A lot of things you can do in R also. Not, not all of the advanced calculations, but but in R, R so it makes it very nice making nice plots. And all statistical tools. It's a statistic language. You want to make all types of statistical tests, you can do it. <coughs> and it's all op- completely free. So there, and there, there is a pretty good bioinformatics project called Bioconductor that I, I know people using. So there's. So it's like an R package for bioinformatics, kind of a lot of things. And so, uh, yeah, so, but we are not doing it here. But it's, 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 if you're starting something in bioinformatics and, and you don't think the Python fits you, this bioconductor might be a good thing to compare it. Particularly, a lot, lot of good packages for like comparison expressions of proteins, lot of, but you need a statistical test, it's, it's, it's quite good. There are a lot. I don't know. There are a lot of packages. I don't know. Yes, there are a lot of things there. Man, a classification of microarrays. Well, a lot of things. And uh, by routines for functional analysis, by logical networks. A lot, lot of things that are. So this is the this kind of alternative, open source package. I think that is. Used. I mean, BioPerl still for exists, but I, at least the people I meet are fewer and fewer that use it. Python is taking over. Okay, so what else did we talk about? I really like the bug that was an actual bug. Yeah, I hope, I hope it's not a myth. Yeah. I know I got it from somewhere. Uh, Google knows everything, as always. Uh, yeah, Grace Hopper were in the first. Uh, this is, yeah, this is probably, yeah, this is the same I have. Same thing. Hmm. Grace Hopper on a moth between the relays and Harvard Mark II computer sheet. Yeah, so that's like, as, as supposed to be. At least according to the internet, it's a, tr- it's a true story. Which we always know it's true. Well, okay. Anything else you learned? So, what did you do in the lab yesterday? We were researching to answer some questions about first assignment of mitochondria and uh, genomes between prokaryotes. It's a bit, a bit surfing on the web. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of tools and things and found 
Yeah, so we will talk a bit more about databases mm -hmm. today, a little, a little bit about different things. And uh, I mean, there, there are so, for, so for bioinformatics is kind of a very broad definition. I mean, it's part of it is pre-computed programming, part of it is particular algorithms that we use, but it's also one part of it is kind of general knowledge of what, what is out there. And it's, that is something that always, of, of course always changes, it's like because the new things coming or, or up all the time, but it's, it's, it's anyway, some parts of it is going to be part of the course also, that you should know, you should know what, different, some of the databases out there, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So, um, uh, Yes? What's the difference between computational biology and bioinformatics? There used to be, uh, I mean, people use different terms. Like in computational biology, it's more, in general, I would say, if you are in computer science department, you do computational biology. But if you, so basically, you can have algorithms, you can very much focus on the algorithms. But if you're in the biochemistry department, you do bioinformatics. And but otherwise, that, that's, I don't know straight lines. There are people who are overlapping, but so it, for say, somehow you, some people focus more on the algorithms than more computational biology. But there's also parts that are like more simulations, as I probably call them. Well, they maybe call some. Sometimes you call theoretical biology. So like you try to simulate an ecosystem or a cell or something. Like that. But really, the, the terms are intermixed. It's like the uh, big journals, and called plus computational biology, and there's a lot of bioinformatics there. And there are also, I mean, there's a lot of, even if you look, look at maybe even computational biochemistry, you know, like simulations of proteins and so on, which is much more chemistry, are also often, it would not be called bio, bioinformatics, but in, in computational biology, it could certainly be included. So like, you mean, drug design, I mean, things talk about, like, not so much in this course, but in the following courses, which is, I would I would say bioinformatics some of them, it should be something often that have a big database, like often genome sequence, but it but the terms are intermixed. So there are a lot of people that just are I mean that are I mean some people are focused more on the biology, but even in computation biology a lot of people that focus on biology also, so it's, it's not uh, absolutely no straight lines between them. Any other questions? Or should we go on? Yeah. How big is the like the variation in difficulty between sequencing different genomes? Because I can imagine that there must be some genomes out there that are really a hassle to sequence compared to others. But then again, it seems like the it would be fairly the same for all genomes. How big is the variation? In uh, it's huge. Uh, basically, size is the major factor. So uh, and. Uh, my size and also if they have very many repetitive elements, oh, yeah, and then it's somehow related. It doesn't have to be the same thing because some can be size because just applications or things, and they are not. But particularly if you have basically if you have the same nucleotide, very very or very low variation, of it, and then it's very very difficult because basically all all genome sequencing is today and well still there are a few new methods coming out are based on sequencing quite short parts and then put them together. So this is one of the stories from, uh, well, from the Human Genome Project. So, so the, the, what they start, the project started on actually of dividing the so human human genome is three billion bases or two, two copies of it, but three billion bases. Uh, so the whole project for ten years almost basically tried to take parts of the genome and put it into, into clones of the bacteria. So you can see because like maybe ten thousand or hundred thousand bases at a time. And then, and in those days, you had this long well, gels, basically. So you run, you, and you got like up to thousand bases in a row, which is. But yeah, so you had this, and you should divide the parts. It was a little lot like effort of loading it, and it was quite expensive. But then, what happened was, it was shotgun sequencing. So basically, just you just put some radiation, or you basically ultrasound your genome and get smaller, smaller pieces, and you sequence random parts. They tried to use computer algorithms to work to get that together. And nobody really thought in the beginning that you could do that with the human genome. Because it was just computationally too complex. And you know, if you have a few hundred uh, or if a piece, if you have 
800 bases, you have more than um, a million of these that are, and then also sorted at random in the other force. You need to have, I mean, how do you, how do you put it together? So, uh, but then, uh, particularly Craig Venter and the Gene Myers and people, and the, the, the private companies that did it, show that you can do it on, uh, maybe it was, first, first on yeast, I guess, and then, then just awful, I think. And then they basically did it on the human genome also, so that it, that's what it was common, joint publication, or two publications at the same time, from the public con consortium and the private consortium. They didn't do, use just small pieces, they have some, they have some tricks, like you could, they had used the fact that you had bigger pieces and you can sequence on both ends. So you know this end and this end is about 10,000 base pairs from each other. And they used this for like constraining things together. And uh, <coughs> so they, they, there was not really a random small piece together. And what, what happens after, happened after that is basically is that most of the new methods that for sequencing that are much, much cheaper is next generation sequences that people have got are doing even shorter parts. So like it's some of them illuminate has about fifty nucleotides, and I think that, that even some so they are, and because it I mean they are much much cheaper. So you can do much more. You can do fifty times more for the same price. So it, it's similar. and of course assemble genomes from these is if you only had that data, it's quite difficult. And then even the human genome. I mean, now you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't need to assemble. You just map it or whatever is there. But it, there clearly are. Case where you really know if you have applications, so basically if you have, so basically if you have something that looks like, and we have part of the genome, and then what you do is you map all the reads you have wherever the map. So if, for instance, if this part is duplicated, so you actually have two copies of it, that and are almost identical, I mean they're duplicated recently, you would never see that. You would, but what you see instead is that you have more reads in this than you have in the surrounding regions, and then you cannot do that. So, so it's not, so still, it's, it's, this type of things are harder to detect. And uh, it's, um, there are some new techniques, it's Oxford nanopores, so that you think that basically tries to read very, very long pieces. Basically, you read the genome a single, uh, you don't need to duplicate it, you need to do PCR. You basically take a nucle one, one single molecule and read it from start to end. And then you can read quite, I mean, not the whole chromosome, but quite many thousands of bases. I don't know, they are not really, well, they are, they are selling their equipment and they are coming out, but I don't really know. I think they are quite, there are two, uh, two or three companies out there that are doing that. I don't really know how, it's really, it still is like the Illumina modification methods are the co most common platforms, but <laughs> it's changing every week almost. So, and so, so certainly we have, there was a project, the Scilife Lab, so where I work. So they had a sprouse, so the Christmas tree, the gran, and that that is was completed maybe two or three years ago, two years ago, and it, and it was a, it's about ten times bigger than the human you know. and it's, it, so it was really really hard, and probably ninety percent of the sequencing, so they had to do put things into clones and take apart and put into E. coli and sequence and parts and that, so and they used a lot of mix of different techniques, and uh, in particular the, the competitors had, there was almost Canadian, of course, you know, other big three in the country, they were almost beaten them because they had better computers, and more, uh, one very big computer for a long time and tried to put all the data together. So they were actually doing it fast in this way. So it's really putting it together. And still it's not, even in this case, we say, hey, it's finished, but still it's not like exactly you have a chromosome from A to B, you have gaps, and you have things like that, so you have parts, you don't really know, you know how to come together. So really, finishing is, is always a question of really when you, and uh, the human genome has been finished for the last 10 years, but it's changing every year, anyway, so, it's, it's, so it's still, uh, <coughs> uh, you decide when you finish it somehow. But so, certainly bigger and more repetitive uh, things are more difficult. And in general, trees and plants are often more applications in, than in most animals. And it's, uh, that's particular some, some parts, of the, often it's mostly, most parts of plants you can find some that are smaller, but I think in pine trees it was hard to find some this is all big. Don't know really why they are big, but, uh, but yeah, that's the way they are. So, so yeah, so the assembly of genome is, is, is a difficult problem. So it also, yeah, it's still a still number of computational challenges that people trying to solve. But partly I think these new new methods that can read longer things will help. Okay. Should we start talking about databases?
Well, do you have any more, qu- any more things you want to say? Yeah. Not today? I'll do it. I think I'll...